have a little bit of a bite from this. So what I'd like you to do is stand up. Yeah, yeah, so many practical issues. 
students that might have about 80 here. Yes. Who do you think, what kind of students might need help from you?
working out whether somebody has depression or anxiety, whether they're psychotic or, or you know, whether they've got a, a substance abuse issue. Really, it's just recognising that someone's got enough worries that they might need extra help. So it's really giving you some sense of confidence about being able to talk to people about some difficult things. To start to think about this, um, I suppose it's important to understand what mental illness is in a, in a formal way. So it's, it's a diagnosable illness that affects a person's thinking, emotional state and their behaviour and it disrupts their ability to work or carry out their daily activities and engage in satisfying personal relationships. So, it, you know, some people find it really helpful to have a, a, a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis from a doctor or a psychologist, and that can be helpful because they can feel like, yep, I know now what's going on, I know what it's called, I know that other people suffer from it, and I know what to do about it. But for other people, it can feel like a, a yucky label that they carry. So it can feel like it's something like a branding that, that is off and that defines them. You wouldn't want to get too caught up in that idea. I suppose you can take the lead from the student if they let you know that they've been diagnosed with um, a mental health issue, then, then that's something you can go along with. Um, but again, you certainly wouldn't be expected to say to them, I think you've got depression or anxiety or something like that. And I guess another thing to bear in mind, you know, while we're talking about this is that if something happens throughout the year for your student that is pretty big, you know, like maybe somebody dies or there's a major accident or somebody develops an addiction or there's a big change at home, you would expect that they would get upset. So not, not every person that gets upset is necessarily mentally ill. It is that difference. So here are some facts about mental illness in Australia. And I could hear Matt giving them a bunch of facts there too, but we won't spend too much time on this. Uh, so an important thing to know is that approximately one in five Australian adults will experience some form of mental illness in any one year. In this age group of first year students, and this might include some of you as well, so from 16 to 24, the likelihood is, is one in four. So that's a quarter. 75% of all serious mental health and related substance use disorders begin before the age of 25. So this is really important. So the first time that somebody will be dealing with a mental health issue is likely to happen at this time in their lives. So will be the first time that they're seriously dealing with some of these things. It can, so some of these things can be short term and very specific and um, limited to a particular situation or event, or they can be chronic and long term. It doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. And I guess the important thing is that, that there really are effective treatments out there and most people with a mental illness can live a productive and, and happy life. They can learn to manage some of these conditions. Many of them are not there may be elements of them that, that go throughout their lives, but they are able to be managed. And I guess the thing about this stuff is that a lot of people don't realise that it's going on for them. So you might expect that the students you deal with have never really thought about it as being the issue. They might have always felt really bad or really sad or really, really worried and panicky. That might be kind of normal um, for them. So. You know, the earlier that they can be connected to help, the better. And some more statistics for you. So there was a survey conducted in 2007 uh, with respondents aged 16 to 85. And they were asked to comment on how they felt about things themselves. So it was their own self-report of how they were feeling. So this data is a little bit flawed in that way, um, but it's still got some important Things. Do any of you notice anything in particular before I reel off the obvious things? What stands out? Anxiety as well? Yeah, so that's actually um, the most common mental illness. So 
So a lot of people think that depression or substance abuse issues are, are depressing issues in Australia, but we find that, that anxiety is actually the most common thing. Now I'll go into some of the symptoms, but basically it's, it's the anticipation of something bad happening and having connected body symptoms. Anything else that stands out? Um, substance abuse is significantly higher than the symptoms as well. Yeah, yeah. And any guesses about why that might be? What's going on? Yeah, partly. But also, um, it's thought that, that substance abuse can actually mask some of the other conditions. You know, so people might turn to booze as a way to cope when they're feeling really anxious in a social situation. Or when they're feeling really flat and like their life's not going anywhere. Alcohol can be the thing that makes them feel a little bit better. Any other things that really stand out? Any surprising things? So there's a couple more. Uh, females tend to be higher on anxiety and depression, but males are higher on substance abuse. And the idea here is that maybe men are more likely to turn to, to foods to help or, or drugs to help them cope whereas women are maybe more likely to identify what's going on as anxiety or depression and maybe more willing to talk about it. So that can be something to keep in mind. It's not a strict rule, but you know, depending on whether you get a guy or a girl to look after, that could be something to, to be thinking about. Um, and the other thing that might, might be surprising, maybe not, depending on what you're tuning to in the media, is that alcohol abuse is approximately three times more common than other illicit drugs, or other usually illicit drugs. So people are much more likely in Australia to have issues with alcohol than with, say, marijuana, or LSD, or something else. So starting to think about some possible triggers why people might uh, struggle in life or why they might um, start to develop mental health issues. There's a whole range of them and I'm sure many of them will sound familiar for you. So often if there's a family or relationship breakup, this can be you know, something to set off the feeling of struggling. Deadlines, exams and ongoing pressure. So um, in first year it can be just that transition as well from high school and what the expectations are there to what the expectations are at university. I remember being horrified and, and struggling a lot with the fact that I'd gone from being an A student to suddenly being a C student for a period of time in first semester because I was getting my head around all these expectations. If there is actually a trauma, so if something significant happens for the person that has thrown them and their whole world out of whack, that can vary a lot um, for people, you know, what one person considers to be a trauma may not be for someone else, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Also global, so if your students are international students, but they're not, or possibly, they could, be. they could be. So, you know, at the moment in the world, there's all sorts of things going on, and so if you happen to get a student that's from a war-torn area, or, you know, significantly economically disadvantaged or environmentally, um, disadvantage, that's something to bear in mind as well. So adjustment, issues around meaning of life and identity, so do I really want to be at university, what am I going to do after this, what's the point of my life, why do I bother with all of this, those issues can become pretty serious. If there's a death or, or a loss, so loss of home, pet, a relationship, drug and alcohol, so um, I know there are certain halls at the university that have lots of parties and lots of fun, but this can actually, over the year, become a bit of a trap. Um, and that could be something to look out for as well. The person might actually have existing mental health issues that are then made worse by new mental health issues, or there might be physical illnesses that, that are going on in the background that make it difficult to manage as well. So there's a lot going on in the first year of university and any of these things could be happening for the students you look after. Um, on top of that, there's managing lifestyle, you know, part-time jobs, living out of home, a busy schedule, boyfriends, girlfriends, friends, all of that stuff. And I think the idea here is um, it may be difficult at times, but I guess 
we all respond to these different situations differently. So, for example, you might be able to manage a breakup with relative ease. You know, you might feel upset for a few weeks and then be able to reconnect with your friends and rely on them and, and get into study and, and sort of carry on. Whereas other people can be really um, feel like the world stops for a period of time after a breakup. So I guess it's it's being a little bit non-judgmental. Um, and another really important thing that's not on this list is financial stress and also sleep or lack of sleep can be strong predictors of psychological distress. So something to look out for is if, if the students you're dealing with or your friends or anybody seems to be tired a lot of the time, that can actually be a clue that, that things are not going well. So what you might observe in a person, um, I, I suppose again, there's no need to diagnose, so it's not a matter of you looking at this list and trying to work out what's going on as a diagnosis, but I guess it's just starting to be aware of some of these clues that things are not going well. So if you notice that they're avoiding participating, so maybe it's somebody who you've been able to catch up with pretty regularly and then all of a sudden they keep um, rescheduling or not rocking up, that would be maybe a clue that, that something's going on. As I said, if they're feeling flat, if they look flat and tired, they don't seem to be motivated or able to concentrate, that can be a clue. If they sort of seem to, to have an ongoing sadness, they, they generally seem pretty sad when you talk to them and they easily cry. That's a pretty obvious clue. If they generally have a negative attitude, they talk about being hopeless and kind of lost and like there's nothing they feel they can do. That's another one. They might also be grumpy. They might be the sort of people that, you know, lash out. So they might attack you for something small or attack the people around them for something that, that irritates them. They might be quite forgetful or confused. If there's any evidence of alcohol or drug use, what are the clues, do you know? What might you smell? Come on. Can you can tell the difference between the bad person and the parents. It'll smell awful. Yeah, there's a bit of a difference there. So you might smell um, different smokes or you might smell alcohol on, on their body because it actually goes through the sweat. Did you know that's why breathalysers work? Because it actually gets excreted through the lungs and the skin. Um, what else might you know what else might you notice in them in their bodies or, or in their behaviour if, if they if, you, if you're thinking they might be using more alcohol or drugs? They're hungover all the time. Mm. And how do you know someone's hungover? Yeah. Tired Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Glasses in the middle of the day, dark glasses, headaches. Yep. Also bloodshot or squinty eyes can be another clue. They feel if they look really lethargic, that can be another clue as well. Or if they're really, really high and it's sort of nine o'clock in the morning and it seems to not be coming down and it's really quite weird and you've never seen them like this, that could be another clue. Another clue that something is not going well for someone is actually poor hygiene. You might think that they're just a bit slack. Some people are, but a lot of the time it's that um, you know people when they when they struggle to care about their lives, they also struggle to care about how they they are how they are in themselves. So if they you know seem to be wearing the same clothes all the time, it, it's pretty clear they haven't washed their clothes in some time or washed themselves in some time. That can be a clue. A really difficult one to deal with, I can tell girls, but um, it's one that that can be a worry and with all of this stuff you're always welcome to come talk to one of us first before thinking about how to approach it with them. If you actually observe or, or they report on a panic attack, so what might you notice about somebody's breathing when they're panicking? Yeah, really fast and really shallow. What might you notice about what might they report about their heart? Very fast. Very fast heart rate. What colour might they be? Pale. Possibly pale, or they could go quite flushed, quite red, because there's a lot of oxygen trying to get 
to the, to the arms and the legs at that time. They might seem quite confused, like they can't think straight, they repeat themselves, um, they get really, really fidgety. So suddenly they just can't, their hand can't stand still, they can't stand, they can't sit down, they've got to move. Fidgety is a really good clue that someone's not going so well. Another one that's kind of harder to um, explain it really clearly, but if you notice somebody talking in a really strange way, as in you can't follow what they're saying, it's not logical, it doesn't make sense, you can't even repeat it back to them, it's all over the shop, then that's a pretty serious one and you'd be wanting to get the linked in with us really quickly or to come to us pretty quickly. If they actually talk to you about death or a really tricky one, that, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but a more vague one is wanting to escape or wanting to get out of here or never come back. That sort of language can be a clue that they're thinking about suicide or self-injury. And we'll talk about what you do there. So before we talk about suicide, we'll talk about non-suicidal self-injury. So I think you might have heard this as self-harm in the past. It just depends on if you have heard of it in that language before. Much you have. So this can be um, kind of hard to, to understand if, if you don't know much about it or haven't had any experience with it. Um, and I don't need you guys to understand this in full, but I'll just give you some general information. So what it is, is a deliberate self-injury um, that's often used to cope with difficult and painful feelings. So it might seem kind of counterintuitive, but, but I'll give you some reasons why people have reported that they do this. So some people talk about wanting relief from tension. So when they feel really, really tense, rather than knowing what to do with that tension, they might harm themselves as a way to distract from that tension. It might be to stop themselves feeling numb or empty. So often when people are quite depressed, really depressed, they don't really feel anything. You know, they could be looking at the most beautiful sunset on a gorgeous beach with hot cheeky day or guy next to them and there's nothing coming up. Um, so it might be to actually experience some kind of feeling. Others talk about wanting to change the behaviour of other people. So, you know, ones that I've heard are things like, my mum and dad don't love me, they don't care about me, they don't, they keep expecting these crazy things from me and I just want them to stop. So self-harm is the only way that makes me feel like I can let them know that this is not okay. It's another way for some people to show that they are struggling, that this is really hard for them and this is their only way of letting them know. Some people prefer physical to emotional pain, so they, it, it seems more manageable to have a cut or a bruise or a burn than it is to deal with sadness, grief, anger or frustration. Some people talk about it's a way of trying to get help, revenge or to induce guilt in others. So there can be lots of different things that, that make people feel like this is what they'll turn to for, for a way to cope. It's usually not a suicide attempt. So it's not that the person is wanting to die. Um, and it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't mean that they, that's their goal or that that's what they're wanting to do. It actually um, has been found in times to prevent suicide because I guess it's people still finding a way to cope, even if it's a way that um, has some serious repercussions. It can be dangerous, but it can actually prevent people from, from going as far as suicide. Does that make sense? I find that counterintuitive, but does it make sense to you? Okay. But I guess that the main danger here is that it may lead to accidental death. So somebody is cutting and they cut too deep. Examples like that. Obviously, if, if there's something really in the, like immediate that you're noticing, so somebody's bleeding, um, then you want medical attention really quickly and, and you sort of be calling an ambulance at, at those situations. So I guess the, the next level up in, in some ways is um, suicide risk. And before I talk about this in any depth, I guess it's important for you to know that it's quite rare that, that you will have, have to deal with this at all. Um, and, and at the 
the outset, it's not about you preventing somebody um, committing suicide. It's really just giving you some general information so that you have some clues about somebody struggling and so that you can get them limited with help. That's really the main thing I want to, to take away. So here are some clues. When somebody talks about feeling hopeless or really ashamed or guilty about something, obviously they actually say or write to you about wanting to end their own life, or as I said before, using more general language around just wanting to escape, end it all, that kind of stuff. If they show no interest in the future, so it might be somebody who totally stops coming to, I don't know if you're going to have arranged appointments with these guys, or will it be in a group, how will it work? Um, so the point of this program is that people come up to them and see them in the Everest t-shirt, and um, they know that they're so it's not like you're, you're not buddies, it's not the No, no, no. So um, part of this is really we don't want, we'll want them to know things, but obviously we want to make sure they can hurt everyone too. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but I guess it's if, if, I don't know, you happen to see the same person a few times and, and you know that they're not really interested in their study, they're not really attending any of the events you talk to them about, they just seem really flat and down. Then, then you'd be wondering about this stuff. If they are engaging, if you happen to find out, I, I'm not sure that you will, but if you do happen to find out that a student is engaging in risky or impulsive behaviour, what comes to mind when I say that? What could be a risky or impulsive behaviour?
kind of counterintuitive. A lot of people think that if you ask somebody, are you suicidal or are you thinking about killing yourself, that you're giving them the clue or the idea that they should do it. And I just want you to know that there's been a lot of research in this and it just doesn't work like that. People won't think, oh, geez, that's a good idea, and then go off and kill themselves just because you've asked a question. Whereas if you do ask the question clearly and directly, people will feel like this is something they can talk to you about and that it is possible to get help. So certainly if you feel that this is something that's too hard to ask, but you're thinking it needs to be asked by someone, then again, you're allowed to come to us first or better still bring them to us and we can answer these questions. I guess the aim of any intervention around somebody who has thoughts of suicide is to help them see alternatives and to get help. This won't necessarily be your role, um, but that's ultimately what happens. A really tricky one is that sometimes when people are, are thinking about suicide, they might say to you, I've got to tell you something that you can't tell anyone. And it might be a really horrible position to be in, and, and, and one option you have is to say to them, look, I actually can't promise you that I won't tell anyone because this is too big but I can promise you privacy and respect. So I won't be telling just anyone, I'll only tell a professional that can help you. I won't be telling your mum and dad necessarily or all our friends or you know, other people in our group. I'll just be telling somebody who really can help. If there is a very high risk, so somebody's actually written you an email and, and a sort of suicide note or I'm not sure you walk past somebody and, and, and it's about to happen. If it's really, really obvious, um, it's about you know getting them help whether they want it or not. So some people will say, no, no, I don't, I don't want anybody else involved. Don't, don't do this. I don't, you know, I'll hate you forever. Um, I guess at this stage, it's about um, making sure that somebody can help them save their life more than than maintaining the friendship or relationship that you might have. Um, there is good news, but I just want to check that I haven't forgotten anything. I guess the other thought is that if we're not here, if it's after hours, um, the next best thing to do is call the CAT team. Has anyone heard of the CAT team? Can you do, do you mind explaining? My friend, my friend does nursing and was on the CAT team, but they did a call out team that will come to the house and help with mental illness and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So they're, they're like a triage service at, at the local hospitals. So if you were to look up, you know, um, one Ash Medical Cat online, you can find it really quickly. And I, I do have some numbers at the end, but I've got to bring cards. So if this is something you want to have access to. I've added in there booklet the um, after hours counselling service. That's a good one too. So there is a, there's kind of two options for you, but the crisis is, they're called the Crisis Assessment Team, CAT. Um, they're actually there largely to assess you know, people with suicide or high risk behaviour. So you can actually call them just to have a chat and advice about what to do, um, as well as to see if they can come out and help someone. And then the other option is an after hours counselling service number. I think the other thing that might be heartening for you to know um, is that the vast majority of people who think about or even attempt suicide, they don't actually want to die, but at the time they don't see any other option for resolving whatever's going on for them. So really the, the clue here is that they need help to work out how to get out of the situation that makes them feel so stuck. Any questions about this issue before I go any further? The idea of, of this talk today and, and you know, mental health prevention, mental health issue prevention in general, is that early detection and intervention is, is really important. So the earlier that somebody can have um, an understanding that they are struggling with a mental health issue and the earlier they can get treatment, um, the better it is for their long-term recovery and wellness. So even though 
mental health is, is a, a, a big problem in early adulthood. Um, young people tend not to seek help early. You know, in, in my experience, most students who are struggling will come in their last semester after they've got a letter from the Academic Progress Committee saying you, you might be excluded from the university, you might need help. That's often when students come to us. Any idea why that might be? Why do people leave it? They don't think it's a chance. Yeah, they might just not realise that, that this is serious and that there's help out there that they just need to plod along on their own with it. What else? Yeah, tell me a bit. I can't I couldn't tell you said it. Stigma? Yeah. What? Can you tell me a bit more? Some people think that mental illness is bad mm. or someone's fault. Mm. of, well, if it's inside me, I should be able to control it. And if I can't control it, then there's something wrong with me. Um, and, and I guess the way I would sort of challenge that or think about that is, if you were to get the flu, um, you might still want to do a whole range of things in your day. You might want to get a whole list of stuff done, but you literally can't. So with mental health issues, it can be like that. You want to be happy, you want to get through the degree, you want to make friends, you want to have a relationship, but there's this stuff getting in the way that doesn't quite feel in your control. Yeah, and judgment. Because I think there is still a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of people will still say, come on, get over it, it's not such a big deal. I've got bigger problems than you. And that stuff doesn't even really help. So, um, I don't think I've given you an example, but in a, in a way, a, a really classic example is is an issue with time management. You know, a student might talk about struggling with, with keeping up with assignments and then they leave it and then there's stuff that's really late and then they're feeling really stuck and hopeless um, and then they get really panicky and worried and then it's their final semester and they're in front of the Academic Progress Committee. So if, if they were to get some help with creating a timetable and get some help with learning skills, you would hope that that could help with everything else. I guess um, here's some ideas about what to do if someone's actually in distress. So I'm talking panicking or crying or um, or really upset for some reason. Oh, I lost it. If you haven't, um, yeah, some things that, that you can do when somebody's actually in that state. So I suppose the first step is something I've mentioned before, which is that it is actually quite normal for people to feel really upset when something significant has happened. So it doesn't necessarily mean they'll feel bad forever, um, but they may need some time to process and, and it might be quite uncomfortable for you to sit with them while they're really upset, but it could just be that they need someone to talk to and that's where you can be of some benefit. I think the idea is that is to let people talk in their own time. So if you ask lots of questions about, and so what happened then, and then what happened, and then who was there, that, that actually can be unhelpful. Let them open up as they feel they want to and need to. And I think a, a really hard one, but a really important one, is to listen without judgment. Um, so you don't have to do much. It can just be to show that you understand what they're saying. If this is a no-brainer, I would encourage you or anyone to go out and get your stuff if they're struggling with something. Mm -hmm. I think many of us have come that way. Um, but it's certainly not recommended. And, and once again, the, the, um, the thing on red meat is, is to come to us if, if you're wanting some extra help or if you think they need extra help. There's some general helping skills is, is making the time to talk to somebody. So it sounds like your role is kind of transient. It's sort of people coming up to you at a random time and, and talking to you then and there. If you, in that, that brief conversation, discover they might need more of a talk, it might be about setting that up, if that's appropriate. 
Yeah, so if that feels comfortable for you, it might be about saying, look, I've got to go to a lecture right now, but can we meet in an hour at, you know, White Bay Artichoke and have a sit down and, and talk for a minute about this stuff. So active listening is, um, instead of asking closed questions, can you really give me an example of a closed question? When the answer is yes or no. Yeah, so when an answer is yes or no, that's a closed question. A more open, open questions are who, when, where, how, those sorts of things. And active listening is really um, saying back to the person what they told you, and that's a way of showing them that you understand what they've said. The non-judgmental factor. A part of this is also being aware of, of stuff about you. So there might be things for you that, that are upsetting and, and will make you feel bad and that you wouldn't want to talk to anybody about. Um, so being aware of that as well. And that's when you can actually, it is totally acceptable to say to somebody, look, this is stuff that's, what you're talking about is relevant to me and it's bringing up some stuff for me, but I reckon you need help. There is a counselling service, I can walk you over there right now. So establishing and maintaining boundaries, as I said before. This is stuff about when, where, how much you see somebody and what you engage with. So although it might be, you might be okay with making the time to talk in more detail, you might only want to do it for half an hour and that's perfectly fine. You might not want to spend three hours talking to them every day for the next week or answer calls in the middle of the night or something like that. It's perfectly acceptable to have rules about interacting with, with anyone in your life. Just like you would with a relationship. You know, you would have rules about how often you hang out, what's okay, what isn't. So the privacy issue is there again. So, you know, I think we all feel like we might want to debrief, but it's about being respectful, so not sharing names and, and details about the person, not telling all their friends or um, other people in the circle. I think um, the booklets you guys have and the information from today, I'm sure will give you the information to know about where you can refer them further. So some unhelpful um, behaviours is acting like a parent. So things like, you know, you really should just get to classes on time, um, or whatever mum and dad tend to say to you. Gossiping about someone's situation. Oh God, Andrew, you wouldn't believe what I just heard of it. That, that's probably not a great idea. Thinking you need to know or do everything. So you might feel like, oh, it's really my job to look after this person and make sure that they're getting through their first year really smoothly and that they pass all their subjects and that their lives are happy. Certainly not. And part of that is becoming too involved. The other side of the extreme is, is being dismissive of their concerns. So saying, oh, you'll be right, don't worry about it, it's all fine. It's probably, you know, if they're coming to you with an issue, it's probably something needing more attention and if you can't provide that, then finding out together who can is pretty important. And another hard one, I think every, this is a human thing, this isn't a flaw, is assuming that what works for you should work for them. Um, so, you know, if it really helps you to go for a run every day and talk to your friends and, you know, have a chocolate every second day, um, then that might not work for, it, for everybody else. And of course, this connects the, to the um, boundaries issue. If you feel that you need to provide limitless support, um, that, that actually could be unhelpful to them too because there's a limit eventually to what you can do. So I suppose the other um, really important part of all of this whenever you're engaging with um, helping other people is, is to also help yourself. So, this might be something we refer back to throughout the course of the year. It's an easy one to forget. Um, but it's remembering that you cannot be responsible for another person's actions when they are stressed, depressed, or suicidal. Um, all you can do is provide some support and information about their options. And you can certainly listen um, to their concerns. It might be that after some time, you might need some brief help about understanding what's happened 
important if you've been supporting somebody. This probably applies more to other parts of your life, more so than, than your role as, as, as mentor. And I suppose a, a tricky one, you know, it, it, even when you are a helper, is to understand that it's not a weakness to ask for help yourself. And another important thing is that a lot of students think, oh, well, you know, yeah, okay, I've had this relationship breakdown and I've been kicked out of home and um, my best friend won't talk to me, but that shouldn't affect my study. I should still be able to do all my uni work on time and, and they're completely unrelated. Often they are related. Often when other things go pear-shaped in life, study can also struggle. So this is what we do in the counselling, the university counselling service. Um, we do, sorry about the second line, that's actually, oh no, that is actually right. Um, so you're welcome to come in pretty much any time between nine and five, and it can be for you or for someone you're with, and you can ask for an appointment that day, and in most cases you'll, you'll hopefully get a half hour appointment with a counsellor, or in the worst case scenario with a doctor you'll get somebody to talk to that day about what's going on. Of course, if, if you don't want to see somebody that day and you'd like to a couple of days ahead, that's okay as well. Usually we don't want to make it too far in advance because things get busy for you guys and it can be hard to make those appointments. So generally, you know, you've got a couple of days. It's, it's short-term counselling, which means between six to ten sessions that you can have with the university counsellor. We do provide what we call secondary consultation. So this is when you're coming concerned about somebody else. It's not for you, it's for somebody else who you want to talk about how to help them and how to support them. If you're just wanting to come um, because you're needing a referral for external ongoing counselling or a psychiatric assessment, then you do that too. We also provide the SMART program. Have any hands up if you've attended it? in the SMART sessions. So it's um, a one hour over five weeks and it covers a range of different topics. So I'm not going to remember all of them, but some of them are stress management, uh, procrastination and motivation, exam busters, time management. And I just can't remember the fifth one. So it's, um, it's a really um, compact hour. It's usually presented in conjunction with the, with the library. Um, so it can be just some general information and some nice little um, golden nuggets of, of suggestions about, about some of those issues. There's also mindfulness-based programs at the university. So this is, um, I guess one way to think of it is a form of meditation, but it's, it's, it's a little bit different to that. Um, so there's sort of programs you can attend that go over several weeks, or you can drop into a lunchtime session where you go in and, and um, pay focused attention to your breath or um, to a sensation in your body for about half, half an hour. And I guess it's a way of training your mind to focus on whatever might be going on and to allow other thoughts and issues to pass by. There's also a mood management program. So if you come across students or people you know who struggle to manage their moods, um, this, this is, a, I think, a six-week program that goes for an hour and a half per week. It's not every day. Um, so I think that can be really useful with lots of practical information. And if you wanted um, much more information, so today really has been quite broad and generic, if you wanted much more specific information about mental health issues, then there's a course called Mental Health First Aid, and it's actually a certificate course, so if you had it on your um, CV or resume, it would be recognised, um, and it goes into way more information about what anxiety, depression, psychosis, substance abuse, eating disorders, and other mental health issues are. <coughs> Another one that um, isn't listed on here is if you have an interest in preventing suicide or, or managing people with suicide issues is another program called Safe Talk. Are you all familiar with the booking system through your My Monash? It's on the left, far left hand side, it's, it's 
literally called Booking System. And it's got all the different workshops, not just for us, but things that are happening all across the university um, all throughout the year that you can sign up to. Some of them you have to pay a little bit, some of them are free. Um, but there's a whole range of stuff I haven't actually checked. Oh, I know there's things that sport do as well, so walks, you know, a couple of times a year there's uh, fundraisers for different things. You do a walk around the campus. Um, there's things like Are You OK Day, that kind of stuff. Matt might have mentioned White Ribbon Day. That's another kind of thing that would come up on the walking system. There's usually something organised formally for those events. And all of these courses that I'm mentioning are on there. So I suppose thinking about who else can help, I've harped on about us a lot. Um, there are doctors at the university as well. There's also, in addition to the university um, funded counsellors such as myself, there's also private psychologists um, that you can see for free for up to 10 sessions per year on the mental health care plan, which I can give you more information about if you're curious. Um, there are social workers, there's going to be dentists, and there are optometrists already at the campus, course coordinators, family and friends, and also DLU, which is the Disability Liaison Unit. So if you happen to know that somebody already has a diagnosed um, illness of some kind, whether it's physical or mental, then um, these guys are unreal. So they do things like write letters to faculty to give people extensions, or um, if they need special conditions to see a family. So some people get really, really anxious being in a room full of thousands of other students. Um, I don't think that's an exception. I think that happens for a lot of people. So DLU can arrange for, for some of those people to be in a smaller room with fewer students, for example. They can get longer times on doing exams, those sorts of things. So they, they offer really practical support to students. And student rights, which I'm guessing you would have heard from. Not tomorrow. <laughs> ah, okay. Fab so you'll hear from them tomorrow. So they're really important to know about, especially when students are struggling with special consideration or um, academic progress issues. So I guess in summary, mental health issues are common, and most start before the age of 25. So it's very likely that you'll come across this somewhere in your circles. Early intervention means that people are much more likely to learn to manage it quickly, quickly up, sooner in their lives and then hopefully progress to, to be able to have you know, fulfilling lives from then on in. I guess that the idea is to consult a professional if you're not sure, as soon as you're not sure. It's okay to not, it might be that, that you've got absolutely nothing to worry about, you might just need to be there for them, you might just need someone to say that or you might need some more targeted support in how to help. Having said that, I suppose if you're really, if you're thinking that someone is seriously thinking about suicide or self-harm um, to themselves or others, it's important to ask for assistance immediately, whether they want it or not. And then your options are the police, an ambulance, security on campus, or us. Another important little thing to know, of course, is that you can't force people to access support and help. You can only ever do so much. And of course, to look after yourselves, that's ultimate. So here are those phone numbers. Um, I'll, give, I'll just leave them up there for a minute in case you wanted to write some down. I'm hoping most of them are booklets, um, but just in case you wanted to um, jot any one down, go for it. So there's the Monash Crisis Assessment Team, the second last one. And here are some other websites. So Headspace is a really great organisation because they provide bulk billing services to people under 25, um, and I think as young as 13. So they usually have a psychiatrist, a psychologist and a doctor, or multiple dolls, um, in their offices. And I believe there is one pretty close to Clayton. Um, Anxiety Online actually has modules that you can complete. So if somebody's so anxious they can't get, they don't want to or struggle to get to see somebody about their anxiety, there are modules you can do online. And there's some other websites as well. That's it from me. Any questions or concerns?
Hopefully you get to do something fun now. Thank you so much. Thank you.